all of them and be the exam. We're now recording and we are live on Facebook. Hey everybody, I am Steve Garvin and I am the host of the Stories of Gold show where each week we bring in an expert in order to help us create a richer story and help our make a world of difference. Today, our, my guest expert is Catherine Steele. And Catherine is also known as the Clear Communication Coach. She helps her audience of international business leaders to speak more clearly so that they can make a bigger difference in the work, the work that they are doing. Uh, <laughs> And is often the case when we have the opportunity to get clear on and to spend some time looking at different aspects of our lives. I'm noticing as I'm communicating <laughs> and introducing Catherine that I'm being a little bit extra conscious of how I am pronouncing and enunciating things. <laughs> Do you often have that effect on people, Catherine? Or? Yeah, I, I think people stand up straighter. They're worried about their grammar. Um, they think that I'm judging them. And I, I always think it's kind of like when you meet a dentist and you're mm. like, oh, don't look at my teeth. <laughs> don't ask me if I'm flossing. <laughs> right? There's something about that. So I'm really friendly. <laughs> you are. <laughs> and I know that because we've had some conversations prior to this. So I, I know that you are very friendly and, and warm hearted. I'm honestly really fascinated by the work that you do. I have a, a son who is going through some challenges right now, but one of the challenges that he has long dealt with is his pronunciation. He oftentimes gets comments from people that he needs to speak more clearly. Mm -hmm. And not just to point fingers at my son, because he doesn't need that but it actually is an echo of comments that i would get when i was about his age that people would say that i spoke too softly that i didn't enunciate that i didn't communicate as clearly as they would like or in in retrospect mm -hmm. as i would have liked so um and I'm probably I getting a call from that comment myself. I have a very quiet voice. And I think because I'm a pronunciation specialist, to do that, you need to have pretty sharp ears. So mm -hmm. I hear things really clearly. And so I think I'm loud, but my audience doesn't think I'm loud. I actually have to figure out in my body where I can feel the force because I can't hear any difference in, in volume. It's mm -hmm. always loud. Um, and but it does make a big difference if if a person can't hear you and it's a struggle to stay in that conversation they will walk away after a certain amount of time to be polite they'll stay with you but you may not get the chance to deepen the conversation and make the points that you really wanted to make because there's sort of an intro period and then we get to the nuts and bolts so if they've walked away before you get to the nuts and bolts because it was difficult to hear you you've missed an opportunity mm. Wow. And that's really interesting. As you're saying that, I'm thinking about two things. One, I'm thinking about how I was speaking to an opera singer last week, and the way she described her voice was the instrument that she uses. And I don't normally think of my voice as being an instrument, but because of that conversation, I think that I recognize that it really is. You know, that we've got this organs and you probably know way more about how all that works than than i do but how do we best use the the instrument that we've been given right and then there's there's volume there's pitch and you know we we can even sort of describe someone as sounding childish if the musical sound is is high if the tone is high mm and aggressive maybe if the tone is low and i found that because i have a low voice people tend to think that i'm confident so mm. it's a good thing to have a slightly lower voice um and you can develop that you can decide that 
you know, I'm going to make my points clearly. I'm going to make sure that my voice is lower so that I'm understood as being confident. And probably while you're trying to think, okay, low voice, low voice, it takes away some of the pressure of your delivery because you're busy thinking low voice instead of, oh, have I said all of my points, right? <laughs> it probably helps with the, the nerves. Yes. At times it helps. At times it it is challenging. I, I, I've been an active member of Toastmasters for the past six years. And one of the things that is often spoken about in that setting is vocal variety. Using, you know, different tempos when you're speaking, you know, rate, using a higher voice, using a lower voice, uh, you know, just the different dynamics that you can use in order to create a more interesting, not monotone voice so that people can be more engaged in what you are delivering. That, mm -hmm. that there's a content of what you're delivering, but then there's also the, the delivery of what you're delivering. And, and the two are, I have learned, are not the same thing. I find it intriguing that um, we create a speech we're thinking about our topic and our five points and our conclusion and our introduction and trying to grab their interest. And what really needs to happen is that somebody is listening to you and you want them to really understand what you're saying, maybe get them on board if it's a topic that they may not agree with originally. And all of that comes into the tone that you were talking about, the vocal variety. Here's a new idea. So I'm going to raise my voice here's a new idea mm. because that's a new idea and i'm going to signal it somehow with my hands with my eyes with my voice and then i get back into oh my god you would not believe and then a much slower kind of one word at a time to show how shocking it was and that kind of thing is easier when you think of the person that you're speaking to so if you're mm talking to your friend, you wouldn't say, yeah, we went to a movie. It was okay. We had some popcorn and then we went home. It's like, yeah, we went to a movie. It was okay. You know, I don't think I would recommend it. Uh, we had some popcorn, always a good thing. And then we went home. Yeah, it was a pretty early night. And mm. <laughs> there's a lot going on because I'm speaking to someone that doesn't happen if you just memorize a speech. Mm. Yes. Yeah. And that's one of the things that's interesting as I have, I have spoken many, many, many times and only less frequently, I have developed a speech such that not only am I speaking, but I'm developing that speech so that it's not just delivered once, but it is delivered multiple times. Mm -hmm. And the more that I do that, the, the better the quality of what I'm of that speech and the delivery of that speech. Mm -hmm. You no longer have to think what's the speech and you can play with it and actually see your audience. I know for me, when I walk into a room, I'm fairly shy. I will try to get my back to the wall and slowly open my field of vision so that I can sort of see who's there. But at first when I go in, I can't see anything. I'm nervous. And so this is sort of the process of delivering a speech as well. At first, there are so many things to worry about. It's sort of a white blur. And at the end, you don't even remember what you've said. And then as you have a chance to say it again and again, you can play with technique and you can think, okay, I need to make an offer at about this point. I don't want my tone to change too much. I need it to be similar to the beginning uh, so that it doesn't sound salesy. And then I deliver my pitch, but that's probably quite a ways down from memorizing the original speech to get yes. in it smooth for someone that's listening. Absolutely. You know, and it, I find it, I'm reminded of two things. One, that I, one of the speaking trainings that I have done was with someone who did what she called intuitively speaking. And she was a trained actor and just had a really wonderful stage presence. And the way that she taught what she did was creating the structure in which we could use those that structure in order to speak more intuitively, speak more uh, 
freely without having to memorize every word. Mm -hmm. um, because there's also the the downside of having every word memorized is that you, you have to, uh, there's the, the pressure of delivering exactly what you said. There, whereas when you have more of a, a loose structure, but a structure that supports you, it can be much more dynamic. Um, and I think engaging. Yeah, I love PowerPoint for that reason. I try to find intriguing pictures and they are a signal to me of what I should be talking about at each step in the, in the presentation. And so I don't have to be on script. I'm going to talk about that point and however mm -hmm. I deliver that point will be fine. <laughs> and it might change depending on who's listening to me. So if I get some chat in the, in the, you know, if, if there's some engagement in the webinar, for example, and people are posting in the chat, then I can say, oh my goodness, okay, you guys in Boston, um, this might be something of interest to you. Or I can say, okay, we have a few engineers on the call today and I can tailor based on what I know about my audience. And so my presentation will be fairly, excuse me, different, but I will cover my points, right? The same points will come up. Nice. Yeah. And I've seen your PowerPoints, or at least some of the, the slides from your PowerPoints. And unlike many people who fall into the trap of trying to fill up every single square inch of the, of the slide with more content, uh, you use it more as a, from what I remember, you use it more as a, uh, an environment where you can talk about something. You're not, mm -hmm. your speech isn't on the PowerPoint. It's the PowerPoint supports the speech that you're delivering. Mm -hmm. I do my right. best to do that. And I, my images uh, are usually trying to evoke an emotion of some kind. Mm. So, That's so important. Yeah, so good photos. I'm always on the hunt for good photos because they tell a story. Absolutely. As I say, a, a picture can tell a thousand words or more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm curious also with regards to how, and maybe you might use different language than what I'm going to attempt to, to use to describe what I'm thinking, is, is there a way to establish the choreography of your speech so that it does what you want it to do? to do like you were talking about just a moment ago about a, a new idea right and and mm -hmm. that you change the, the the tenor of your voice the pitch of your voice mm -hmm. in order to establish that idea of of newness right um, mm -hmm. i would say that um you know we're always encouraged to use point form and that's part of that when i get to this point I'm going to do something. It's a new point. And so you can play with that. You can play with how you're going to be different for each of the points. Mm. You might have three points on the on the screen. You start quietly, you get to medium, and then you get to really loud or the reverse. Uh, you could go slowly, quickly, and then back to slowly. Um, just something that, you know, somebody in the back row that's having a little nap, <laughs> it's time to wake them up right and keep them with you get their attention get their attention yeah nice. so we, we have five fingers right and quite often we're thinking of three points and an introduction and a conclusion so there's my three points my introduction mm. and conclusion and i fold my fingers or i tap them on the on the table or my leg or something um as i go through them so that i sort of know where i am and what i've already completed huh. and then, um it it allows me not to think so much of everything that I wanted to say. I wanted to introduce this point. So definitely in these five points, my voice will be a little bit different, right? And do you see my eyebrows and my face right, moving right. closer to the camera? I think it's partly, my dad is very dyma dynamic. Mm. And so you tell a story in a certain way. And if you think of, you know, an Irish yarn or some other story, you know, if you're from Mexico and it's like wild and elaborate hand motions, use it, right? Mm. That's that's interesting. We we enjoy that. Even if we think, oh my goodness, look at those. They're like Italian. They're moving all over the place. 
that's cool because they are emphasizing the points that they think you should be paying attention to and waking you up. Nice. <laughs> and you have people using NLP and different things where they will cough, they will snap, they will they will do something that jerks us back into the here and now and back to them. Oh, they're coughing. What's going on? I'm back. <laughs> they snapped. Mm. What was it? I missed it. And I'm back. Right. Interesting. So, mm -hmm. so when you talk about using your voice and you're using the examples of, you know, snapping or coughing or whatever, it's more than just what's coming out of your mouth. And in fact, you, a moment ago, you also used the idea of having five fingers and, you know, you have your, your intro, you have your conclusion, and then you have your three points in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm hearing that using a more conversational style, using more of a, more of the resources that you have is more than just the words you say, it's more than just the, the voice, the, uh, vocal voice that you're using it's more of a full-bodied experience i would say so um we know when we're speaking on the phone if a person is smiling if they're frowning we know we know all of that and it helps us to decide what our next comment will be and so you need to allow your listener that full experience as you mentioned by not pulling those things out and that that's one of the things that is an issue, I think, with the idea of creating a personal connection is that we we whitewash everything and it's too clean. Mm. Our lives are not that clean and we're interested in what's cool and different about other people. And so allowing the person to hear your funny comments and see you moving and, uh, you know, imagine how wild the topic was with you as it was as as though it was happening with you in the driver's seat um yeah that that's all very powerful stuff huh interesting yeah. while you're saying that i'm thinking about you know when i'm when i've been on the phone with somebody and i honestly am probably on zoom calls more than i am on phone calls nowadays particularly but you're right in that, you know, when I when I'm calling customer service and I and they're just kind of going through the motions and it's they, yeah. the image that what I'm hearing on the other side of the line is that they're just bored and just want to get this done with. It's not engaging. And then I've had conversations with people and friends who are much more lively and you know they can keep the conversation going for hours and. Um, bring lots of physicality to the conversation and it's just such a different experience they might even be using the same words but but the experience is so different because of what they are bringing to that conversation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the you know the most important thing in our world is ourself so if mm. we can see that the other person values us and enjoys us then there's a very tight bond created a good friendship or a good working relationship and that's through all the little things all the i love that you know so if you if you put some emotion into your phrasing men are going to do this less than women but you know the people that are successful and they are you know shaking hands for sure patting you on the shoulder as they leave i really enjoyed our conversation so how many times do people not say i really enjoyed I just love learning about what you're doing. This new project sounds amazing. So we've got loved and amazing and enjoyed and appreciated and all these little things that are fairly simple to add and that will really create a connection with the listener. Nice. And that's yeah, if we hear, I loved your project. I love your project. What we really hear is I love you and you're smart mm. and you're creative, mm. right? Which is really, it creates good value. <laughs> Absolutely. And, it, you know, I, that's a really interesting point. I'm, what I'm realizing as you're saying that is that, one, I, I know for myself that I always want to feel connected. I always want to feel valued. I want to always want to feel like what I'm 
saying is both interesting and helpful. Uh, and when I mirror that back to other people, that naturally they appreciate it just as I would appreciate it when people do it for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there have been some conversations where the person is not going to get on board with what you do. They're not going to buy your product. They actually have a completely different point of view and it's very hard to find touch points. However, you can still have an amazing conversation and say, you know what? I have never thought of it that way. That was really enlightening. There are ways to still show that that person is valued and, mm. and that you've learned something. And we always love that, that we're able to teach somebody something. So, yeah. Right. That's interesting, especially in these uh, sometimes challenging times where we get so caught up in our ideology and so forth that, you know, if, if you don't think like I think, then I don't want to continue this conversation. Whereas if we look at it as far as what is the value that this person is delivering? Well, how can I glean something from this rather than just reject it because they think differently than I think or they value things differently than I do? Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Even to the point where it might just shed some light on a previous conversation that hadn't gone well. And now you could say, oh my goodness, now I kind of understand what was happening. And that's so valuable. Mm, wow. Well, you're really helping me see using my voice and all that that contains is more than just, again, more than just the words that I'm using. It, it, in order for us to have a relationship with people, we actually need to have a relationship with people. <laughs> we might only have a few moments, but there are some very cool people out there and we don't want to miss it. Absolutely. That's really cool. So I'm curious as a, a couple of things. One, how do you become more conscious of the voice that you're using? Mm -hmm. People hate to hear themselves on the answering machine. <laughs> they hate <laughs> recordings of themselves. But I would say, if you have someone that you admire, that you love to hear, that they're, they're a dynamic speaker and you enjoy listening to them, a, a podcast or something that you really think that person has a nice voice, then record yourself and see how close are you to what's interesting about that other person and what could you add little by little that makes your voice interesting too. And, and maybe you have a great voice, right? Lots of people think they sound terrible and their friends are like, no, you have a nice voice. Right. So, um, that might be one way to do it. And we've got lots of examples now of podcasts and YouTube videos and Facebook lives. And we get a chance to meet some of the really the best speakers in the world and some mm. surprising excellent speakers that are not, you know, most people don't know who they are, but they are excellent in their own way. So sure yeah, take advantage of that so do you have some favorites that you like listening to i really like daniel pink mm. and, uh, simon sinek for sure mm. yes and there's ken robinson and uh, these are classics right people admire how they present they admire their voice they admire their thought pattern and the mm. way they can shift someone from one point of view to a new understanding Yes. I enjoy, I subscribe to Daniel Pink's letter, newsletter, as are 160,000 other people. But literally, that's what he reported out a couple, I think it was a couple of weeks ago. Anyway, um, but one of the things I really appreciate about his newsletter is he always has a, a little video in there. So it's not just the, the written words in the newsletter, but there's a two minute video that you can go and watch. And one of, the, one of the ones that comes to mind is his tip on finding answers while we were sleeping. And so he, he dons a, a nightcap and you know is in bed in the video and just talks about how by setting the intention and asking the question when we go to bed that that allows us to, our unconscious mind to work on it while we're asleep. And oftentimes when we wake up, we have the answer to whatever that question was that we started the night out with. 
I love that. That's really nice. So, yeah. So tell me, as um, as a woman, how do you use Daniel Pink, Simon Sinek, and uh, Ken Robinson to develop your own voice? Right. And I should say Sir Ken Robinson. I realized I had not right. here. Um, I think it's pacing. Mm. And one of the things that I've realized, just like any rock band in history, they come onto the stage and they say, hello, Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> and if they don't get a response, then they keep trying and they go mm. slower and they make more spaces between their words and they check their sound system and they do all this stuff. There's always a beginning point where you check to see whether your audience is with you. And I, yeah. I liken this to salsa dancing. So salsa is a live dance that um, people dance for fun. There's grandma, the little kids, everybody in between, teenagers doing their wild and funky stuff. But if a teenager is dancing with grandma, they're not gonna do all their funky moves. They're gonna mm. start with just the basic ones and then a little turn and they go to the point where grandma starts to look a little bit unsure or unstable and they back off and they go back to the three or four moves that were comfortable for grandma. So that's what you do as a speaker. You make sure you've got your audience. They're comfortable with your speed. They're comfortable with your volume. They get your gestures and um, the, the best in the world, and these are, you know, Daniel Pink and Sir Ken Robinson and Simon Sinek, they all do this. And we think it's, it's just an automatic thing, but they're testing the communication because they are having a conversation with someone, right? If they say, hello, they wait the space of hello, whether or not anyone says anything. Mm. The, the, the person has the time to reflect and answer and translate and think, I really don't agree, or maybe. They, they give them the time to go through the thought process as well. Sure. That's so that's really what cool. I can take away. <laughs> that's nice. You know, and as we take the time, not only to be delivering what we're saying, but to reflect on how we're saying it, practicing, I, if you listen to me speak very often, you'll hear me talk about how much I appreciate practice because practice, whether it's, you know, a meditation practice or a yoga practice or a speaking practice or a drawing practice or a writing practice, you know, each of those helps us to improve little by little. If we, if we try to go from zero to 60 in two seconds, mm -hmm. you know, it's likely not going to happen. But if we allow ourselves to practice and just get a tiny bit better with each attempt, then pretty soon we're going 60 plus. <laughs> and uh, so I'm curious. It happens, right? It happens. Well, you put in the work and all of a sudden it's easy. Yeah. And and you're not thinking about that anymore. You're on to something new that you're adding to your repertoire. Absolutely. Because we've developed the, the skill, the muscle memory to do, do things that initially are more challenging. Along those lines, I'm wondering, do you have any practices that, that you engage in yourself? Or do you have other practices that you encourage your students to engage in in order to improve their delivery? Mm -hmm. Well, I know that you mentioned Toastmasters, and in my newsletter, I'm always showcasing a Toastmaster group, mm. and especially now that it's online, there are really interesting ways to connect. You might want to work in that city, get connected with some people before you go. Um, for my clients who are looking at pronunciation issues, that's not something that a Toastmaster group can help you with, really. But if you know what you're doing, and then you can say, Today, I'm really focusing on the sound TH, for example. If you mm. hear anything wild and wonderful, please write it down. Let me know later because I'm, I've am i missed it, right? And that is something that a Toastmasters group can do. And what's beautiful about Toastmasters and other public speaking forums is that they have developed a very nice way of giving feedback, positive mm. and negative and growth. 
And that's something that we often don't have. So you have access to a whole bunch of people who have the same goal and are going to gently guide you to become better and better and better. And you're, you're going to see their growth, which is also very inspiring. So I always encourage people to take part in Toastmasters. Awesome. I love that. One of the things that many of you listening right now know, <laughs> excuse me, is that I started the World of Difference Toastmasters Club earlier this year, which totally benefits from this virtual world that we live in. We have members from where you are in British Columbia to Germany and India and elsewhere wow. that we're all gathered around a central theme of making a world of difference. I love that. Um, so, it, it, and I totally agree that Toastmasters can be a very powerful environment and very encouraging environment for us to practice and to try things that, that we wouldn't otherwise do. Mm -hmm. I know that there's a series of steps and, you know, all of a sudden you're like, okay, you have to do a PowerPoint presentation as part of this, or you have to give an explanation, or you have to um, completely disagree with this topic or something. So all of these skills come into play. And when you need it, you have it. It's in your quiver of arrows. You can pull it out and go, okay, I've Absolutely. tried this. I know how to do this. Mm -hmm. One of the exercises that I've been engaged in on both sides is um, is managing a, a quote unquote bad audience. And I've been both a bad audience member per request and also been the speaker with a bad audience. And it can be really, maybe one of the reasons that we fear public speaking as much as we do is because we don't have that much control over our audience's response. Mm -hmm. But when we allow ourselves to experience that and to play with that and to have bad audience experiences, then when that does happen, then we can deal with it with greater skill and, and perhaps a sense of ease. Mm -hmm. I know that there are lots of bands around the world that had to start in you know they just got an opportunity to play it's probably not the nicest place and people are either asleep over their beer or you know, loudly talking to their friends or heckling because that's just kind of fun on a friday night and so if you can make it through that you know each step of a musician's career gets you know better and better hopefully Mm. But then that idea of the training of being heckled early on, when it happens later, when paparazzi is a problem or what ha whatever happens, you've, you've had a few of those opportunities to practice. <laughs> it may be painful, but at least you know what to do or what not to do. That's a really good example. Going from the heckling at bars to the roaring of crowds at state in arenas. Yeah. You've got to, you, we start somewhere and just by building on what we, where we are currently, we can get to where it is that we want to go. And we've seen people break a string on a guitar, for example, mm -hmm. and somehow keep going. And then in the middle of everything, they're putting the string on and you're just like, wow, you have much more, um, I've lost my word, <laughs> respect. <laughs> For a musician that can take something that looks like a real downer and bad and turn it around, just casually go, okay, I've got a broken string. We're going to change tunes so that I don't have to play that string. And I'm going to, you know, get somebody to run over and give me another string and away we go. Huh. Wow. Yeah. That's a great point. <clears throat> so I am curious, and we're getting towards the, the end of our conversation today. I've really enjoyed it and appreciated what you have shared with me and with our audience. Yeah, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me. You're so welcome. Um, I probably, well, I will ask it here just because I'm really curious as to how your interest in pronunciation began. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's um, way back to about the age of two or three. 
I had an accident on my tricycle. I flipped and slit my tongue. Mm. And so I had to learn to make all those sounds again. And I was a little chatty Kathy and had a big vocabulary. And I had to rebuild that because I had a sore tongue that wasn't making all the sounds very clearly. And I didn't think about that until, you know, not that long ago. When I was in Quebec, I got a scholarship to study French in Quebec. And I was in the advanced group, helping everybody, translating for people who were in lower levels. And all of a sudden, one day, one of the teachers that I really respected pulled me aside and said, Catherine, we can't understand you. It's your pronunciation. And I just, I was devastated. That mm. was such a shock. I remember the waves of heat going down your toes and back up. And down. But I managed to hold on to the idea that I really liked this teacher, that I admired what this teacher had been doing with us. And so I listened and he created a special after school class for six of us, I believe, and stayed with us and created something more so that we could practice pronunciation. And then when I was in Japan, when I was in Mexico, pronunciation was the first thing I tried before having a big vocabulary. And that really helped. People at least could understand what I was saying and I could use my three or four words <laughs> well and then build from there. Wow. And so, yeah, so I became a pronunciation trainer with a big school. I'm a grammar queen as well. I love things like that. I see the connection between the two. Sure. And um, yeah, it's, it's been a passion. It's still a passion. And it really helps um, people get their confidence back. At first they think, you know, maybe they can't understand me. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's them. Maybe they're prejudiced. Maybe I'm too old. Maybe I can't do this. And then they realize, oh, they're expecting a different stress point or a different type of sound and i now know what to do and now i can give them that and yeah things go well so it's exciting okay. and i get to work with some of the best people in the world in various fields tech engineering healthcare financial services public speakers um, people in you know governments i have somebody who's part of a consulate so that really cool people doing cool things. And as you say, right, making a difference in the world. And so mm. it's really nice to be able to support them and get their voice heard. That's excellent. Thank you. Mm. So my final two questions for you, I ask everybody. Um, actually, let me preface that. So first of all, how can people learn more about you, connect with you? Mm -hmm. and, take advantage of, of the skills that you have developed. I am one of those people that prefers phone calls and text um, and LinkedIn. So I'm going to leave that information with you, Steve, and people can connect with me that way. Excellent. Okay. So my now for my two final questions that I ask all my guests are, first of all, in your mind, what makes for a richer story? Ooh, a richer story. Well, I've mentioned emotion, right? Mm. Um, I would say the moments when you were surprised or shocked or extremely enthusiastic or overjoyed or humbled, those pieces uh, make a big impact. So if you can remember to keep those in, not toss them out, uh, your story is stronger and connects more deeply. Awesome. And that actually leads really well into the, my last question. And that is, how are you adding richer stories to your treasury of stories? Wow. Well, as you know, because we meet quite often in um, networking events where the, the goal is to become a stronger public speaker and you know, network to develop opportunities to speak. I think that would be, that would be, the thing just keep working on your your speeches but also find people who value what you're talking about and get those chances to speak mm. something like this where if it didn't go well we could record it again <laughs> <laughs> brilliant right there there's not the pressure to be so darn perfect and i would say probably do that before you do a facebook live um we are live but it, you have opportunities to be recorded on Zoom and have that posted later. 
and that gives you all the confidence in the world that it doesn't have to be perfect the first time and honestly if you're not perfect your audience will connect more deeply with you because they are not perfect and if they're interested in speaking themselves they know how hard it is mm, yes well thank you Catherine, for mm -hmm. using your voice to engage our audience and thank you for being so willing to share your own development, your own journey. You're very you welcome. And I, know, <laughs> I know, Steve, that um, you have something that you would like me to share with them, and I'm going to mention the name of it. It's a guest speaker checklist. Sometimes mm, that takes the pressure off people if they know some of the things that they would be helpful for their host. And uh, so I created something for that purpose. That Excellent. You you know what the host needs and you can develop that and present that when when the time arises fantastic so if you would put the link to that and i will put the link to that in the when i post this uh, thank you again for delivering such a rich story with our audience of authors and speakers and until our stories meet again be the bright light in someone's dark night. Ta-ta.